The third element is the evangelist. This is the one that's sort of most famous and uh, that everybody knows about. These are the faces of the brand in a lot of cases online and within social networks. These are people like Scott Monty at Ford, like Morgan Johnston at JetBlue, like Richard Binhammer and Lionel, Lionel Manchaka at Dell. These are the ones that sort of, you know, everyone seems to think are the glory positions. But it's not necessarily always that glorious and it's not that exciting, and there's a lot more to playing that role than being the external face of the company. You're, you're more than a community manager. From an internal perspective, the person in this role uh, can't just be a social media rock star. It can't be just somebody who goes, oh, I, you know, I have lots of people on Twitter who follow me. Lots of people know who I am. I know how to converse and engage in these, in these networks. That's great, but there also has to be sort of a, a, a business outlook and, and somebody who understands the brand's goals and is willing to go out there and, and pursue those goals. They're not just a community manager. Don't think that if you've put somebody in on your blog moderating comments on Facebook or your blog that you've done this well. That's, that's sort of a, a meets minimum to doing this. The person also has to be able to build bridges and, and consensus internally. They have to be going back to those other parts of the organization, whether they sit in marketing or PR, communications, customer service, whoever's got the lead. They've got to go back to all those other parts of the organization, sell them on it, get them to help commit resources, get them to be willing to, to cooperate with, with whatever social media initiatives are going on. You also want somebody who's not going to get so focused on the external role and being the face on Twitter and, you know, hey, we're going to go do this, this offline you know, social media activity with a tweet up and that's my job. Those are all the fun parts, but they need to be equally focused on that internal aspect of it. They've got to go to lots of meetings. They've got to go sit through budget, uh, budget sessions. They've got to go through and negotiate or, or navigate when, when there are power plays going on or when there are disputes or disagreements about what the, what the right strategy should be, which means that person will eventually, as your social media lead, start to offload some of the community management and some of the sort of public face of it. It seems sort of heretical, I guess, to in some social media circles to suggest that there are, you know, the, the lead social media person ought to be spending more time offline inside the company than outside. I honestly think that that's just sort of a, a sign that we're maturing as a, as a practice and, and that this is a legitimate business function. And instead of just being out on Twitter or just being out in, in external networks, the person has legitimate inside the company uh, roles and responsibilities to carry out. And you also want somebody who's got some experience or seasoning. Uh, there's still a tendency in, in a lot of circles to turn social media and turn the, the Facebook page over to an intern or the new hire or somebody who just came in. And it doesn't mean that those, those people aren't uh, unable to do this. A lot of, a lot of you know, new hires or interns could be very good at this. But it's not just about being out on Facebook or just about being on, on, in some of these networks. It's about representing the brand, getting the right message out, making sure that you're conveying the information that you need to convey, reacting to questions or challenges or criticism in a, in a, in a healthy way. And the reality is there is no other piece of the business that you'd put an intern or a new hire, you, know, you wouldn't just plunge them right in. You wouldn't have a new hire into the communications department calling the New York Times in her first week. You wouldn't have a new person in the media or advertising site setting up your Super Bowl ads for you. He just wouldn't do that. So the idea of just turning it over to the kid or turning it over with, to somebody who hasn't done it before, but we need, we need somebody out there, could really lead to trouble for you. So they need to have some sort of experience or seasoning in, in, in the space. External keys to the role or, or sort of outward facing. Uh, first, the person does have to be actively involved in social networks. Even if they're not constantly out there, even if they're not the main face of the brand, they still need to be out talking to the community, understanding what, what, the, what, the, what the audience's needs are, understanding the emergence of new platforms, uh, and, and honestly taking the heat when something goes wrong. You'd be surprised at how many companies will turn direction for social over to a traditional marketing person, a traditional PR person who doesn't have a Twitter account, or if they have one, it's locked, who's not really active on Facebook, who wouldn't know how to start up a blog on WordPress if, if they were you know, walked through it, and yet these people are still given the keys and said, okay, go build our social strategy. That tends to lead to traditional marketing tactics, traditional PR tactics taking place rather than a recognition that this is a separate animal and with, with new rules and new etiquette and, and something you have to be familiar with. You also have to be comfortable showing some personality. Uh, it can't be just a sell job or going out there and constantly pushing messaging or talking about the, the business that you're in. 
an, an example that uh, that works well for me. I am a hockey fan as well, and had the have the uh, pleasure of living in Detroit, where we've got a pretty good hockey team. During the NHL playoffs, I would be out on Twitter, both from my own personal account and from the, from the company account, talking about the hockey games as they were happening, being happy when the goal when the when the Red Wings were scoring, being unhappy when the other teams were scoring. You might think that that's not really related to the business. That's not really a good idea. Why would people want to hear about hockey from from a car company? Well, you know what? Not everybody's always out there looking for messaging from a car company. But if people are on Twitter and they're following along with the hockey game and they're looking for people who are talking about hockey and they start to engage with us about that and then we keep that conversation going, later on in the week or later on in the month when we do want to talk about our business, they're now brought in. They're, they're not brought in because they were looking to hear from us about the cars. They're brought in because they're looking to hear. They, they just were following the hockey game and found some fun people. So that, that show of personality does help. And, and, and you know, it's not as frivolous or trivial as it may seem. And somebody who's not comfortable doing that, somebody who's not comfortable showing a little bit of their, their, their real side or their fun side, is probably not going to do very well in this role. And finally, you need somebody who's going to rent this position and not own this position. One of the dangers that you have when, uh, when you're a brand is that your social media lead will, will go, oh, you know, this is my community, this is my audience, they follow me, uh, this belongs to me. That's great, and to a large extent, this, the evangelist has built that community for the brand, but it still belongs to the brand. It's not about the individual. You have to think about it as somebody who, who again, rents and doesn't own the position and is not threatened when others come along, doesn't feel a, a, a problem going, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to sort of offload this to some other people on my team now and let them take over the account and, and keep building the community. It's not yours as the evangelist. It is the brand's, and you still need to, to think of it that way. There are a few deal breakers on both sides, things that you should be looking for in a social media evangelist that uh, you know, if, if you don't see them or if you do see them, you just kind of go, uh, you know, I, I, this isn't going to work. From a business standpoint, when you're interviewing a candidate, first deal breaker is if the person comes in talking with an overemphasis on their personal brand. I did say and I mean that personality does go a long way and it does help in this space and, and helps build an audience. But if somebody goes into the interview talking very much about how their personal brand can help you and how they're going to put their personal brand to work for your brand, you can't really be sure that they're always going to have your brand's interest in mind. I'm not necessarily trying to hammer the concept of personal branding. That's a, a conversation for another day. But when you're talking about somebody who's going to represent an organization or a company in social networks, their personal brand has to come second. And if they've, if they've hit it too much during the interview, you need to, you'll, you'll be always wondering or worrying about that. Who, who are they really in this for, themselves or, or the company? No marketing or PR background. Again, it's, it's very possible for people who've never been in marketing or PR or ever represented a brand to be very successful in social media as an individual. We're not talking about individual success. We are talking about representing a brand, and you can't really plug somebody into social networks with, with fast response and, and quick criticism and everything else if they don't have any, in, any background or any, any experience kind of handling that and representing a brand and not just being for themselves. If they haven't done their homework, and you know, again, this is the same thing as, as any other interview, but if they come in talking all about social media strategy and what they can do on Facebook and what they can do on Twitter, but they don't seem to know a whole lot about your business and they don't seem to understand or, or be willing to talk about how they can apply some of those concepts back to what you do and back to what your company does, that's probably not somebody you're going to want to bring in. And you know, related to that, if all they do when they come in is throw a bunch of buzzwords at you and lots of jargon and try to dazzle you with talk about G, you know, Pinterest and Google Plus and Tumblr and Clout, and they're throwing all the new shiny objects at you, and they're not really talking about anything, but they're just sort of hoping that you'll be so impressed that they know about all these new networks that, that uh, you know, you, they'll get the job. That's probably not who you want to be looking for. They, again, need to be strategic. They need to apply all these tools back to your business. If they can't do it, don't hire them. Catchphrases, this is sort of a, a you know, just a, a personal beef. Not only is that an emphasis of, you know, if, they, if they're ending every tweet, every post, every everything with some sort of a catchphrase or if there's a, a, a phrase that they're associated with, that makes them very good at personal branding and, and sort of establishing themselves. But they're doing that branding through a gimmick, and gimmicks usually have a shelf life, and, and you're looking for somebody who's going to build a long-term successful program rather than just sort of getting the quick hit buzzes. So I watch out for catchphrases when I see them. Uh, 
unrela unrelated titles, professional immaturity. It's become, uh, you know, fashionable in, in social media circles to, you know, oh, I'm a social media ninja. I'm a Jedi. You know, if you're looking to hire an assassin or a galactic religious warrior, you know, great, that's, that's the person you're looking for. If you're looking to hire a professional who's going to build a program for you, you don't want somebody who's assigned themselves the same title as a bunch of cartoon turtles that love pizza. You want to find somebody who's, who's got the professional maturity to take the job seriously and isn't just in this sort of lark because it seems to be fun. And finally, you want to look for actual business results. And this goes whether you're hiring somebody from the outside or promoting somebody from the inside. If you ask somebody on the outside, okay, what business results have you, have you achieved? What, what kinds of things have you delivered for clients? And they give you the number of times that they've spoken somewhere or references for their book. That's great. It may make them very smart as an individual consultant. But you need somebody who's got a history of actually delivering business results. They should be able to tell you, well, I did this project with this client and it had this result, and the client was happy, and, and there we go. If you're promoting somebody from the inside, they should be able to, you should be able to look at their history and go, did they deliver? Do they have a history of doing what we asked them to do and excelling? Do they, are, is this the kind of person that we believe really can build a practice? Now, on the outside, if you are the candidate and you're interviewing with somebody, and the, or if you are the business and your candidate is coming in and interviewing with you and they don't hear these things from you, is probably not the right fit as well. You have a lack of clarity in the organization over who owns social. The last thing that somebody wants to do when they're coming in and trying to build a practice is get caught up in a bunch of turf wars and get caught up with a bunch of internal politics and not be able to do the job that they're going to do. You also don't want, as the candidate, to think, well, gosh, I'm coming in and I'm being hired by the marketing department, but it's very possible that the communications department is also hiring a director of social media and you know that's just going to get confusing, or that that's that's going to be uh, you know sort of a we're both going to be doing the same thing. It's redundancy, so there needs to be a very clear statement of this department that's hiring you is 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 in charge of social. That's going to be your job, and don't worry about the rest of it. You also need to have a clear champion for social. You need to know who's going to have your back if there are disputes. If another organization within the company decides that it should own social, who are you going to go to? If there's a dispute or if you need more money, who are you going to go to? If the business can't tell you who your champion is and who your go-to person is, it's probably not the right fit. If there's not a commitment of resources or if they're kind of hedging both on how much money you'll have to work with and you know, people resources, it's probably not the right fit. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a huge budget. It doesn't mean that you have to have uh, you know, a commitment of several hundred thousand dollars. I've seen companies or organizations be very successful on very small budgets. Uh, it's just that they should be able to tell you what you're going to have to work with before you go in. If, you, if you're looking for if, a, a candidate and you can't give that person an idea of what they have to work with, they're probably not going to want to take the job. Failure, failure to understand or commit to interaction. Way too many organizations are still looking at all these networks and thinking, how do we get our message out to 800 million pe people on Facebook? How do we push information out or, or deals out and get some revenue from 200 million people on Twitter? That's a failure to sort of recognize that the main currency in, in social is that interaction. Let's face it, the audience can go to your website, to your press site, read a press release. They can get that basic promotional information from you in about 15 different locations or from a, you know, a whole myriad of other places. What they are looking for in social networks is, yes, information, but they're also looking to interact. They're at looking to ask questions. They're looking to have their criticisms answered. They're looking for help on a customer service issue. If the organization isn't committed to that two-way interaction, then it's probably not a good fit for the candidate. And finally, if social media is pushed to the kids' table, if it's kind of handled as a, a standalone thing where they just kind of go off and do their own thing and doesn't have a seat at the table, the problem with that is, is or by seat at the table, I mean isn't involved with leadership conversations, isn't involved in knowing what else is happening in the business. The problem that you get with that, frankly, is in, in, in social networks where information travels fast, where people are going to be, you know, uh, news can break and 15 seconds later or 15, you know, five minutes later they're, they're asking questions of the, of the company on Twitter or on their Facebook page. If the social media team or the social media person hasn't been clued into what's happening, hasn't been given the opportunity to learn what's going on with the company, hasn't been given the opportunity to understand what the answers are to some of the questions they're going to see, that person's flying blind. And flying blind in an instant response kind of environment is a very, very dangerous thing. So if you can't commit 
as a business that that person is going to have a seat at the at the leadership table, and I don't mean business leadership. I mean just understanding and being told what's what's happening. It's also not going to be a fit, and that's probably a deal breaker.